Good evening. On behalf of the Indiana University College of Arts and Sciences, I would like to thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Vanessa Klo, and I serve as the college's Director of Alumni Relations. Our Food for Thought live streaming series serves as an opportunity for alumni and friends to hear from faculty experts, explore topics of interest, and stay connected with IU and the College of Arts and Sciences, regardless of your location. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that Tonight's event is being held in collaboration with the college's semester program. Semester is held each fall semester and combines academic courses, public lectures and exhibits, film showings and other events to engage students and the entire community in a collective learning experience about a timely issue. This year's theme is resilience and tonight's featured topic highlights a course being taught by Professor Ketterson. To learn more, visit Themester indiana.edu. At this time, I'm delighted to introduce our featured pre presenter, Distinguished Professor of Biology, Ellen Ketterson. Professor Ketterson, who earned her PhD from IU, teaches courses in animal behavior and biology of birds and conducts research on the evolution, ecology, and biodiversity preservation of songbirds. She also is a co-director for the Midwest Center for Birds and Biodiversity, also known as MCBB. Following her presentation, Professor Kettison will be joined by fellow MCBB co-director and Environmental Resilience Institute Research Fellow, Alex John, for the audience Q&A session. Dr. John's research focuses on how ecosystems in Indiana and beyond are changing as a result of climate change and urbanization with implications for human health, food security, and broader environmental resilience. He focuses primarily on bird migration. You can submit your questions at any point during this evening's discussion. Simply click the Q&A tab located in your webinar toolbar, hover your mouse over the screen and your toolbar should appear. Now, it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Ellen Ketterson for her presentation. Good evening, everyone. And Vanessa, thank you very much for introducing me. I'm Ellen Ketterson, and uh, I'm a professor at IU, as Vanessa just told you. I, uh, what do I do? I also represent the Environmental Resilience Institute and the Center for the Integrative Study of Animal Behavior. And as Vanessa said, a newly forming uh, Center for Birds, a Midwest Center for Birds and Biodiversity. Uh, I teach courses, animal behavior, biology of birds, evolution, and most recently a class in avian conservation that corresponds to the semester, that's a hard thing to say, to the semester that's happening right now entitled Resilience. I'm going to assume that most of you have an interest in birds or you might not have signed up for the event. Um, but I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. And if you have the ability, there's a little chance to raise your hand at the bottom part of the screen here, the Zoom screen. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, uh, imagine yourself in the room with the rest of us. I can't see you, but you can see me. <laughs> And what I would be doing if I could is sort of asking you to stand up if something were true about you. So for example, I would ask the room, um, do you like birds? And if you did, you might like click the yes or imagine yourself standing up. And uh, could you identify a cardinal if you saw one? And you might remain standing or say yes to that. Uh, do you have a pair of binoculars? Um, do you like to look at birds? Do you go spend time uh, looking at birds? And if yes, please stand up. And my fourth question, have you ever taken a course in ornithology or biology of birds, either in high school or in college, or even a, a, a course from the laboratory of ornithology might be a less formal course. So I'm looking out at the room, only I can't see any of you, but what I'm imagining is that maybe, unless you're really a curmudgeon, you all said yes to liking birds. And maybe even 90% of you could have identified a cardinal if one was put in front of you. As for owning binoculars or having ready access to them, I don't know, maybe 
And then uh, that last question, have you ever had a course of any kind? And maybe now we're down to say 10%. And I didn't know, maybe a hundred people, who knows? But if a lot of you were standing up, either mentally or raising your hand, then I could conclude that I was speaking to the choir. Except you know what? I think we need a choir if we're gonna save birds. So may I join you in singing the praises of birds. Uh, it's time for me to share my screen. Let's see if I can do that smoothly. Okay, um, I'm gonna start with this video and the video makes the point beautifully and effectively in a way that my words really wouldn't be able to do. So let's watch this together. It's just a couple of minutes. So if you didn't already know that in the past 50 years, there are 3 billion fewer birds in North America than there were, this is a time that we can all come together to understand sort of how do we know that and what might we, what might we do about it. Another way of saying 3 billion birds are missing is to say that one in four birds is missing. Uh, and I'm gonna show you a little data here so that you can appreciate where these numbers came from. Some birds were harder hit than others and these graphs help portray the story. So on the left, the x-axis, the one at the bottom is the year starting in 1970 and running to just about 2020. And on the y-axis, the vertical, it's the change in billions of birds. And it's set up so that the baseline in 1970 was zero. And what we see by the time we reach 2020 is that we're minus three, or again, 8 billion to 5 billion in 50 years. In the middle panel, we can see drops in abundance or not in different groups of birds that live in different habitats and different biomes, as you might say. So there's different colors there. If you look at the bottommost one, it's tan. If you look at the uppermost one, it's kind of a bright blue. And what those lines portray, again, is at the top, that's a group of birds or a habitat where the decline is next to nothing, or actually, as we saw with the waterfowl, a slight gain. On the bottommost one, the tan line, that's the grassland birds. And if you look at grassland birds, both in that precipitous drop over 50 years, or in the rightmost column where you can see a histogram bar that's tan colored that's at the very bottom. And that's expressing the same thing in percent change since 1970. 50% of grassland birds are no longer with us. That was galvanizing for me. And I will tell you a little bit more about how that, in a sense, reading this paper, late 2019, has changed the way I'm spending my time and my resources really uh, to try to make a difference about something that I see is incredibly urgent. Now the one thing, a point to make about this is that people care about birds. So they count them, they go out and get them. Maybe you had a yes to the parrot wet, uh, owning a pair of binoculars or, or being a bird watcher. But all the rest of our biodiversity out there is experiencing similar kinds of declines, but we don't have the same counts. And to me, another thing about the power of this study is that we have the data. We aren't imagining, oh, a lot got killed here, or a lot got killed there, but not really having the difference in abundance from the then and the now. And as so often is said, birds are a canary in the gold mine. It's usually with respect to us and our well being, and that's true. Uh, but they also are a stand-in for so much of biodiversity because we have the information, because we know. How do we know? Well, let me just say a few more words about that. I'm saying people care. Well, they care by participating in things like breeding bird surveys. And those have been going on over this 50-year period. The radar part that you saw in the film is a little more recent. And so those are devoted volunteers who follow protocol. And they, in an early week in June, drive uh, a prescribed area, stop at fixed intervals, get out of their cars, listen, 
look and record and turn all that information into a global or really, I should say, national database. So it was possible to know how many birds were being seen during a breeding bird survey in the grasslands in 1970 and how many were being seen by similar kinds of people going through an identical protocol uh, 50 years later. So in addition to this information here, which as I said, I found to be totally galvanizing, I wanted to know, as does everyone who sees these data, uh, what's going on here? You know, how, why are all these birds disappearing and all that they represent behind them? So these are the big four, habitat loss, pesticides, collisions, window strikes, and the like. And I'm sorry to say the cats that we own that we let run free. And when we're looking at something like this decline in numbers over such a long period of time, I think, again, to really grip, let it grip you, let you really fully understand is uh, what happens when an abundance goes down like that. Well, either you know the birth rate has gone down or the death rate has gone up so that the numbers that are present over time are a reflection of the birth rate and the death rate. And when we look at these causes for decline, I think when we're looking at habitat loss, we're really looking at a decline in the birth rate. There's fewer places to live, so there's fewer offspring being produced. And when we look at pesticides and collisions in cats, we're looking more at increases in the death rate. And then the interaction, obviously, of the birth and the, rate and the death rate are what determines how many birds are still out there. Now, I have a particular bird that I love, and I mentioned it ever so briefly. And with the rest of the time I have here, pretty much most of the time I have here, I want to tell you some things I learned about the bird in relation to its capacity to respond to the kinds of environmental change that we have going on around us. So this is a really quick one just to show you how many are gone. So where was I? <laughs> you know, seriously, studying this bird and uh, not being aware of decline, simply learning as much as I could about it as a researcher in the time that I had. So the video shows you the bird in action. This gives you a glimpse of the bird where I studied it for 35 years or something like that. Uh, and that's in the forests of the Appalachian Mountains and the Junco. Uh, it, it's a bird of the understory. So it shows up in, actually in this place, it lives year round, but in the spring it uh, prepares to reproduce. And so males enter a territory, defend it, and they sing their song, which is this, in, uh, vocalization that you just heard. And singing that song often attracts a female. Females are a little lighter gray, as you can see. And when the male sees the female, he gets very excited and he droops his wings and he spreads his tail and he does a different vocalization. It's one that's very quiet. Doesn't really resonate through the woods, but it speaks to her. However, males being as they are, uh, if there's other females in the forest, and males are sometimes lose their attention, and other additional males will come in. And this dynamic of male-male competition and female choice accounts for a lot of the basic differences between the sexes in males and females. This will show you, oh, sorry. Will show you what it looks like live when a male is courting a female. So a female is in the cage and you can see she's reasonably interested in him. He's picking up a little piece of nesting material, sort of trying to make the point that it's time to go to the nest. He's puffed, as I said, and he's moving rapidly uh, to, to attract attention. So that's a junco in the wild. How about juncos over time? Juncos, their broader distribution, and where were they? The last glacial maximum, where are they now? Point being, what capacity to the bird populations that we see around us have to adjust to the climate as it changes? So the present day distribution of the junco is, is depicted here. And it's the same thing. It's the breeding bird survey. How do we know where you find a junco? It's because there's volunteers out there and they're counting and they're reporting. And what this shows uh, is that the junco is a bird of high latitudes and high elevations. So we see it 
starting from the West up in Alaska, down through the Boreal Forest in Canada, down in the Appalachians in Eastern North America and along the, the coast. Okay, now, you know, 15,000 years ago at what is called the last glacial maximum, much of the Eastern US was covered with ice. So the juncos weren't here then, where were they? And if we do something called species distribution modeling, which is a way of saying, where is today's climate? Where was it then? If we assume the birds themselves haven't changed that much, then that's where the birds were at that time as well. And what we see is there, they are along the Gulf Coast, they're in Mexico, uh, still along the, the coast of, of California. So the left is where they are today and the right is where they were 15,000 years ago. And to me that says, given enough time, populations can keep up with environmental change and occupy environments that are beneficial to them. Problem being, we're rushing change now. We're really rushing change. But here's a little bit more sign that uh, birds can keep up. We've been studying juncos in San Diego, which is a coastal city. Uh, it's warm, it's mild, a Mediterranean climate, not where juncos breed. Much more a montane, high elevation, high latitude bird. But for whatever reason, about 30 years ago, juncos that used to migrate to San Diego stopped migrating and they occupied, stayed year round, uh, began to reproduce. And in the meantime, actually have increased their population size and are becoming urban dwellers. So it's possible to compare the urban birds with nearby birds in the mountain to see what attributes make it possible for a bird to occupy a region or really an environment where it wasn't, uh, wasn't comfortable in the past, wasn't found to be more accurate in the past. These birds have changed their plumage a little bit. The one on the right is a city bird. It has more brown on the head. The birds in the city are less aggressive than the birds in the mountain. The birds in the city sing at a higher pitch, which fits with the background noise from machines and buses and the like. And so when we record their vocalizations, we see that the pitch in the city is a little bit higher than the pitch in the mountains over, uh, over the top of the environmental sounds. When we bring them into captivity, we find that that's, that remains, suggesting that it's a, an evolutionary change. Uh, that persists because we can bring the city birds and the mountain birds into the same environment. We call it a common garden and their songs still differ. Uh, it isn't something that's just, uh, just external to the, what the noise is doing in the background. So options to an animal where the environment is changing rapidly. They can change their behavior, they can move, <laughs> they can go extinct, which is not much of a choice, right? And what we know about way too many, sorry, way too few species is whether they can do this fast enough. How flexible is their behavior? How rapidly can they evolve? These are questions that basic scientists are asking in this time of environmental change. And the junco is one of those that has kept up in the past and actually seems to be adapting to new environments now. So it's always important to have a little hope in these depressing statistics of declines in numbers. Uh, it's not only San Diego, juncos have started breeding in Los Angeles, in Denver, in Cleveland. We don't really know why. We do know that this is environmental change that is being accompanied by a change in the distribution of a once common bird of which there are now 186 million fewer than they used to be. And I'll say it again, what so much of life needs is the gift of time. If we can slow the rate of environmental change, animals have enormous adaptive capacity and we can hope that some of these declines can be reversed. So with the, some more time that I have with you, I'd wanna tell you, what are we doing here at IU? So the grand challenge, uh, an enormous investment in three important societally complex problems, cancer, the environment, opioids. A great deal of money was invested in a program called Prepared for Environmental Change, giving rise to something that we founded as the Environmental Resilience Institute. Grand challenge ends as a year, a, a big scramble. It's absolutely necessary to sustain 
what IU began in this uh, Prepared for Environmental Change Grand Challenge. We're trying to make accurate predictions. We're trying to come up with solutions. And we want to implement those solutions with interacting with communities around the state and the region. So natural scientists and social scientists and people who interact and work with uh, communities and ask communities to work with us, uh, that's an important part of how we combat environmental change and the negative consequences of that. We're doing some projects on campus. One of those major causes of mortality was window strikes. Birds running into windows, they have thin little skulls, they fall to the ground, they die. This on the left here is just a couple of weeks ago at the World Trade Center on 9-11 uh, Memorial. A woman named Sarah Wanamaker with whom I work is doing uh, searches for window strikes. She has a team that are doing this here on the campus. We wanna make IU more bird friendly with respect to window strikes, which are again, a major cause of mortality. So Sarah and her group monitoring just six buildings over just the last four weeks have come up with a hundred dead birds. That's an underestimate. Uh, you know, predators walk off with them, building managers pick them up. There are more than a hundred, they only are doing six buildings. So it matters and we're gathering the data just as that decline in bird numbers was galvanizing. I think this understanding about window strikes can be galvanizing too. We wanna be part of the solution, not the problem. I'm gonna point out Alex here, who's gonna help me with the questions. Alex is doing a fantastic project working with sometimes birds as threats as opposed to threats to birds, which is birds are transmitters of diseases like avian flu or West Nile virus. Alex is a tracker, we'll let him tell you, but he's been uh, putting tags for tracking movements on robins in Alaska and on robins here in Indiana. And we're seeing here, what's the path that they take from the breeding grounds to the wintering grounds and back again, remembering that with each trip they're making, they're also carrying their microbiome and potentially any parasites they work with. And finally, we're doing some outreach things that are so much fun that I just wish I had more time to tell you about them. Uh, Jim and Susan Hengevel do a banding of saw wet owls. This is their grandson. Uh, they capture these saw wets and again are integrated with other sites across the country. MAP stands for Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survival. And Eve Cusack here on the right, Montessori teacher with her husband, Sam Cusack, is undergoing a MAP session here, 10 times in the summer, banding birds, marking them, seeing if new birds are being produced, how many at what time. And there's some kids here that are observing closely. Eve and Sam also teach a camp for uh, with Wonder Lab. It's entitled Flight to Feathers. Last year was the first session that wasn't a pandemic session. And uh, everybody signed up on the first day, it was closed. So even Sam are gonna offer two camps this coming summer for sixth to eighth graders on learning how birds and their importance in the environment and kids love it, as you can see. What else are we doing at IU? We're offering courses in this resilience semester. I'm teaching a course in avian conservation for the first time. Trying to teach a new course is always a scramble. I'm learning so much, I'm enjoying it, and my students are so rewarding. So I'm totally hooked <laughs> on teaching this class. We wanna make it more general across the planning a program in conservation biology at Indiana University uh, that'll require coordination across multiple schools and I believe attract uh, students from really around the country to want to come to IU to, to be part of our conservation biology. And founding a center, Midwest Center for Birds and Biodiversity. And after I am quiet here, uh, maybe we can uh, return to the website and we can show you some of what we have in mind. So what can we all do? And I'm just about to finish up here. We can know the facts. I show you graphs because graphs are data and data are what persuade lots of people anyway. So knowing the facts and speaking up with your neighbors about your awareness about environmental change and your awareness about declines in biodiversity, absolutely critical. Really the most powerful thing that a person can do is to stand witness. You can do things in your own life, avoid pesticides, reduce the window glare or light at night because birds are attracted to artificial light at night. 
We can confine our cats. Those are things that are within our power. We can plant native plants and we can reduce our carbon footprint. <laughs> These are not corny things, they're real, okay? The plants that we put in our gardens that are not natives, insects are not born there, they're not attracted to them, there's not food for the birds when they get there. It's just basic ecology that if we have native plants and native insects, we will have more native birds and it's within our power. And if you can't garden and you don't have any money, you can always give your time. You can speak up with your neighbors and you can give your time. And I think those are absolutely the most powerful ways to try to preserve biodiversity for our kids and our grandkids. Okay, many thanks. I'll uh, stop sharing now. Thank you, Ellen. I am, um, hello everyone, I'm Alex John. Um, as Vanessa introduced us at the beginning, I'm a co-director of the Midwest Center for Birds and Diversity along with Ellen. Fantastic talk, Ellen. I really love the way you communicate. Yes. And I, you know, you communicate also your passion for birds. And that's, and that's important. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen, I want to ask you before um, other people join in with questions. What has um, IU meant to you as an alumni? Hmm. Well, that's, you know, that's a pretty easy question for someone like me because I, uh, <laughs> there's no escaping my age. I arrived in Bloomington in 1963 as a freshman and I earned my undergraduate degree here. I earned a master's, I earned a PhD. So I'm IU trained from the very beginning. Uh, my husband went to IU, his brother and sister went to IU, his daughter went to IU. I went away for a year for a postdoc and a couple of years to teach at Bowling Green State University. And then I've been back here ever since, enjoying uh, the beauty of our campus. Any alums out there, you will know <laughs> how fortunate we are to have a green and wooded campus that changes colors with the seasons. And uh, you go from class to class and you don't have to go through a lot of traffic you can uh, go through the woods. So I still love all that. There's like mesa plants in Dunn's Woods. There's things to be done. <laughs> I remember more wildflowers in Dunn's Woods when I was uh, go taking classes, you know, to identify plants. Uh, so I'm sorry, I think that answer is really too long. I, I guess I think I just lived it. You know, I've lived the IU experience. I'm grateful to IU, grateful for the opportunity to learn here and grateful for the opportunity to, to be a teacher. Um, after that. So yeah, it's a great place. Well, I've only been here three years, but I love it already. I feel like <laughs> a real Hoosier. <laughs> um, okay, we have some questions coming in. Uh, Joseph asks, is IU Bloomington doing anything to mitigate window strikes? And as part of that also, uh, Patricia Foster asks, how do you reduce window strikes? So those kind of those two questions kind of go together. Yeah, they do. Okay. So um, thanks for the questions, Joseph and Pat. Pat and I know each other. Um, in terms of what are we doing to try to document, uh, that's what this searching of buildings in a protocol driven way to try to get accurate measures of how many birds are hitting windows. There's a lot of anecdotes. I was talking to Professor Christoph Ermscher the other day, really and uh, a catbird had just hit his window during the daytime. Uh, that case was good. The, the catbird was stunned, but it came back around. Uh, it's happening all the time. That view of what all those birds that are dying in New York City. We can turn off our lights at night. The buildings, many of our buildings are well lit. We're gonna start calling out buildings, those that are like most guilty <laughs> of uh, being illuminated at night and those that are uh, most account for, account for uh, the most lost birds. You know, there's uh, a guy named Bryce Hembaugh, Hembaugh and he's, in, uh, he's an engineer and he's in our uh, computer science here at IU and he makes devices. So he and Sarah Wanamaker who are working on this project are uh, devising uh, devices that will be attached to windows that will be able to reduce the labor involved in documenting the frequency of strikes because the 
the sound will be recorded. And as these things get further developed, they're likely to be possibly at least body size specific, not necessarily species specific, but you'll know if it's a small bird or a bigger bird. And they're also collaborating with some people that are studying the impact of wind, wind, window strikes uh, at William and Mary. There's a good program at Butler too in Indianapolis. Some of our listeners may know about that. But documentation, I hope, will turn into action. And that's gonna, you know, every time I see a new building go up around here, I worry about the glass. There are things that can be done. Glass can be angled and it is less dangerous to birds than it is if it's upright and shiny and reflective. Um, I guess that's, that's sort of what I have to share now. We would like to go to our vice president for facilities and get some buy-in for reducing mortality from window strikes on the IU Bloomington campus. Awesome. Uh, we have another question from Jane Martin. What is the biggest need of the ERI, the Environmental Resilience Institute at present? Oh, Jane, that's a great question. And I'm glad to have the opportunity to, uh, to answer it with this, with our alums about us. Jane is a wonderful person. She's um, been a significant booster of the College of Arts and Sciences and Indiana University. Um, we're really grateful to her and I'm grateful for that question right now. The grand challenge, five years. This is the fifth year. In order to be able to go forward, we're going to need support from the university. We are also going to need to demonstrate, as I believe that we're doing, that this is the moment for the environment, that federal agencies that may have been holding back on environmental investments are ready to do them. And we're ready to take our research efforts and our implementation efforts and put those dollars to work. But you know, philanthropy is, it's really important. And if you think that the environment is something that you would like to contribute to or institute that is doing research on predictions and solutions and implementation, doing greenhouse gas uh, inventories around the state, working with mayors to make the towns more, fewer emissions and greener. Uh, this place is doing that and it's young. It's young, but it's working. <laughs> so what the Environmental Resilience Institute needs, it needs you to know about it. It needs you to back it if it comes up in a conversation. It needs you to donate it if you happen to be one of those lucky people. Uh, and then we think of ourselves with our Midwest uh, birds and biodiversity as a outgrowth of the Environmental Resilience Institute. So if you have a particular interest in birds, um, then the Midwest Center for Birds and Biodiversity is something that we could use your volunteer time and we could, we could definitely use your, your fiscal support. So thanks for the question, Jane. I hope you're okay. We have another one from um, Alexander Scholl. Have there been any widespread efforts or campaigns to raise awareness on the impact of cats on bird populations? I can imagine cat owners being very defensive. Ah, uh, yes, indeed. You know, I could do that one, but Alex, you know about cat wars. Would you like to take that question? Sure. Um, yeah, so I came to um, IU from the Smithsonian where uh, the director of the section I was in, the Migratory Bird Center, Pete Mara, some of you might know about this book he wrote, Cat Wars. Yeah, <laughs> so there's a raging battle within the uh, community of people who push back against this idea that you should keep your cats indoors, because that's what this book proposes. Um, uh, I'm not sure what the numbers are exactly right now, but it's it's a lot of birds that cats, feral cats, um, household cats that are let out, um, prey upon. So um, I'd say there have been um, some efforts, campaigns, you know, online mostly. I don't know of any specific um, campaigns. Probably some local, um, you know, I I'd be I would. Imagine the Audubon Society as part of these campaigns, local Audubon chapters, for example, um, and national efforts uh, through just dissemination online. Um, but yeah, it's it's obviously given the data that's been collected, and there is scientific research now into this. People have tracked cats; they put little cameras on cats to show, you know, exactly how the cats are uh, hunting birds. Um, anecdotal evidence as well. Um, 
and there are, there have been efforts, but exactly how far um, the the camp what the results of the campaigns I think it's still up in the air. It's kind of an ongoing debate at this point. Is is that your take on it, Ellen? I don't think there's any resolution just yet. Well, I think as our questioner probably really anticipated, it's highly controversial. Indiana Bloomington has its history with deer and deer and native plants don't go well together. Uh, but some people love having deer in their backyards and some people don't. And I don't think these are issues that are readily resolved because there are um, deeply held feelings and beliefs on the parts of people that are not necessarily congruent. Uh, I love cats. I have two cats. Uh, I don't let them sleep with me, but I really do like them. Um, but sometimes if people think that there's a partway solution, I mean, keep your cats indoors, okay? That's number one. If you're not going to keep your cats indoors, think of the times when it's best to have them outdoors. So out at night is better than during the day. Indoors for the season when birds are rearing their young and as young leave the nest, they don't fully fly yet. So they're very, very vulnerable when they're on the ground. Uh, and if so, you're keeping your cats in during the time when there's baby robins and baby wrens and things in your yard, that's not 100%, that's a portion of the year. So I think these part way solutions, maybe not the best, but they're a whole lot better than not doing anything. For example, with light at night, which is not cats, not quite as controversial, but if people will turn out their lights during the migration season, that doesn't mean they have to have their lights out all time of the year. So awareness, partial solutions, you know, this is Ellen Ketterson, I don't speak for all birds or all people. Uh, I think it's I think it's far better to be mindful about reducing the damage than to be at war with your neighbor. Well spoken. Um, okay, we have another question from Stephanie Kane. Hi, Ellen. Thanks so much for your work. I'm so concerned about the songbird infection that has been killing so many of our local populations since this spring. The DNR has been silent for a long time. Do you any do you know anything about this that might might share? Right. Hi, Stephanie. Nice to hear from you. Um, I don't know a whole lot more that's in the newspaper. I will occasionally speak with a DNR person, so I can only sort of give you my citizens' view, which is that it came and it appears to have gone without ever having been identified as to what the cause was. So the effort to take down your bird feeders, if it was a transmissible thing, then that was a, obviously a clear path to trying to reduce transmission. If it was bird to bird contact, for example, if you don't know what it is, then you don't know for sure, you know, that it's bird to bird contact. Um, so well, let's see, my optimistic view might be that it was a, an event that won't repeat itself next year. But another possibility, of course, is that it was something that was seasonal and we'll see another round of it next year. I haven't heard any predictions about what that is. There's a theory. The DNR, as far as I know, does not support this theory, which is that might have been related to the cicada output outbreak or with a fungus that was associated with a cicada outbreak. I feel um, like maybe I shouldn't even repeat that because it isn't supported, but it isn't really uh, done away with either as an explanation. The reason I'd love for it to be true is it would suggest it wasn't coming back for another 17 years. But I have to say, you know, as an expert, you have to say when you don't know, and I don't know. That would be interesting if the cicadas had something to do with it from a scientist point of view, you know, it's just so. Um, so we have a couple of related questions. Um, one is from uh, Jean Tardy. Do we know what accounts for the seemingly good news about the prosperity of water birds? And uh, related to that is uh, from Harley Bailey. I loved your presentation so much. My question is why is it that grassland birds in particular are doing the poorest and why wetland birds in particular are doing the best as compared to other categories of birds in the study? That's great. Thank you both for your questions. I love it when you read the graphs and then <laughs> come up with questions like why. I think the waterfowl thing, 
well, I'm gonna, before I start in with a potential answer, people who wrote this study said specifically, we're not, a, we aren't in a position to name all the causes. We're here to report the patterns. So then you have to speculate. Uh, I think that the water bird thing is most likely to be because of habitat preservation and that hunters, for example, who care a great deal about waterfowl can be great conservationists when it comes to keeping wetlands wet. Indiana didn't do very well on the wetlands thing last year, as you know. But if you go to Goose Pond, if you haven't been to Goose Pond, it just, you know, you build it, they come, it's incredible that former agricultural land where the tiling was removed and the water level rose to what it had been pre-tiling, the birds had just come in from all over. So, you know, snow geese and, oh my gosh, you know, flamingos, which don't belong here, but, <laughs> and that's a segue possibly into, into Alex. Anyway, I think habitat preservation and the role of conservation minded hunters is probably very important. The other one, when you come up with the answer, you go, oh, yeah, of course, um, which would be habitat destruction for agriculture. So our grassland birds have had their habitat um, mowed down and turned into corn crops and wheat crops. And I think there, there's a lot of people that are trying to promote the kinds of big ag changes that might make it possible for food still to be produced in adequate quantities for farmers to make their living and for us to go to the grocery store, but not have to like pick every field and plow it to the very, very bitter edge, maybe even crossing over a stream in order to get to the other side. So there are practices that land managers are coming up with that if we as, you know, we're not, sometimes we can feel pretty powerless, but as consumers, if we can be sensitive, to how our food was produced, uh, I think we can have an impact going forward. Anyway, those grassland birds, their habitat has been largely turned into agriculture. Yeah, that's, that's I agree with that. It's uh, uh, grasslands were converted a long time ago and some of these, well, the hunters do a lot to, they pay, right? Pretty high fees. I don't know what the license costs, but the DNR at least gets licensing fees from hunters to help preserve duck mm -hmm. goose habitat. There's a market, <laughs> so needless yeah. to say, to help preserve those species. Um, Let me start one thing, may I though, Alex? Yeah. Which is when we look at these data and we'll think, well, you know, the Eastern US was covered with forest 200 years ago and then agriculture came along. Just a reminder, we're looking at the past 50 years. Okay, so we've had agriculture for a long time, but that decline in grassland birds is within that 50 years, yeah. 50 years I've been a scientist. Uh, so it's not just, oh, you know, we cut down all the forests and had to, there's things that are going on that are still leading to a persistent yeah. decline in, in grassland birds. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, maybe pesticides. I know you've done some pesticide research on the uh, juncos and other people have as well. Who knows how that's impacting? Yes, absolutely. I, and what, we could go into that, but let's see if there are other questions that, uh, that we could return to that. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, there's so much. Okay, we have another one. Uh, Janet Irwin asks, are you collaborating with the Indiana DNR on specific goals related to its state wildlife plan or similar collaboration with state and federal agencies such as USGS, Fish and Wildlife Service, USDA? Great. Thank you for the question. We don't have anything official when I speak for myself, I can't speak for everyone in the Environmental Resilience Institute. So in our MCBB, while we uh, are in touch with and share information uh, with the state wildlife biologist who's focused on birds, um, we don't have any collaborations going and we're not part of that, our little group, part of that state action plan. We do have some good news with respect to the USGS. So United States Geological Survey Survey Service, Service, sorry, mm -hmm. has just uh, named a new, what they're called Climate Adaptation Science Centers or CASCs for short. And there've been eight Climate Adaptation Science Centers around the country, not one for the Middle West. And just like literally last week, uh, a new Midwest Climate Adaptation Science Center was named and 
IU is going to be one of the nine institutions that are part of it. So Minnesota and Michigan and Wisconsin, Illinois, uh, the College of the Nominee Nation, the Nature Conservancy. So they aren't all universities. And I forgive me, I've forgotten the one. This is a this is a great thing for us because it will have us talking with land managers, and it involves the Environmental Resilience Institute and the chance to include urban ecology as part of the adaptation science that needs to be done for us to be responding to environmental change. So thanks for asking that question. That's great. Gives us a chance to say that this is a, a wonderful thing that's happened to the Environmental Resilience Institute. Yeah, that's a good point. I uh, just added the uh, link to that article in the chat if anybody wants to check that out. Yeah, the, the uh, USGS Climate Adaptation Center. Um, we have another one. Does feeding birds do more harm than good? What should we feed them? Oh, these are such important questions. And, you know, you look it up online, you get five different answers. I'm really confident you could prove that to yourself in, in just a minute. Uh, I've fed birds, which is not the answer to the question, um, since I was a child. In some ways, I think of feeding birds as like zoos, which is it's an opportunity for lots of people to engage and know and understand and see birds. Um, do I think it's doing a lot of harm? I guess I really don't. If people clean their bird feeders, if they don't let um, spoiled food accumulate, uh, I think of birds as pretty, the winter birds that I know, as having a lot of backup places. It's sort of like free ranging cats have backup houses that they go to, which they should not be doing. Um, and so I think birds have a lot of backup places that they go to too. You couldn't put up a feeder and keep a bird there 24 seven, seven days a week. They have their things that they do. So I think even when people are intermittent uh, the birds have have ways of dealing with that. So I am not opposed to bird feeding. I am in favor of people doing it responsibly and with clean equipment and setting it up so you don't create uh, window strikes as part of setting up your feeder. So if a feeder is farther from a window, the bird has a greater chance to accelerate and hit a window. If your feeder is closer to a window, that's less likely to happen. So there are ways to feed responsibly. Good answer. Um, one other one. If you if you are from the Midwest and the juncos originally were from the coast, how did you choose juncos as your bird? <laughs> well, because juncos are here in the winter time, so they're migratory species. They're here in the winter, and then they for the ones that live here in Indiana and in the eastern U.S., except for the Appalachians, they head up to the boreal forest to, to Canada and Alaska to breed. In the days that I began, we didn't have tags the way Alex can put tags on his robins. So we knew they were here from 15 of October to the 15th of April, and we knew they were gone in between and that, you know, they would be being counted up there. Uh, I had an advisor, later my husband, a wonderful person, his name was Val Nolan, and Val had been studying juncos when I began to study juncos, so we worked on them together, and uh, it was something really, really good about being able to go out in the field, set up your nets and your traps. You always had data at the end of the day because you caught birds. <laughs> and you measured them and you put bands on their feet and then you could see whether they came back next year and you could see how old ones differed from young ones and you could see in the very first projects that we did that females were making longer migrations than males so in the autumn now if you caught juncos or saw them they'd be pretty much 50 50 males and females but after the first of december it's winter the populations here are predominantly male and the populations farther south are predominantly female. So females are making longer migrations than males. Then I wanted to study them in the breeding season and they don't breed here. That's what sent us to the Appalachians because it was uh, accessible to be able to study the birds year round uh, when we were in, in Virginia. So that was a lot about me. <laughs> Thanks for the question, but maybe too much. Another one from Harley Bailey. Uh, thank you so much for your answer. I have actually lived between Goose Pond and Green Sullivan State Forest. If you have time for another question, are we seeing a decline in the diversity of trees beyond ash, elm, and chestnut here in North America alongside the decline in bird numbers? 
Again, thank you so much for answering my questions. Well, thank you for asking questions and thank you for attending. And we're about to run out of time. So I wanna thank everybody uh, for attending. I can't speak with authority on the decline in, in trees in, in the region where you live. There are urban foresters and local foresters who know a great deal more than I do. Sarah Mincy is the new um, managing director at the Environmental Resilience Institute, Kim Novak from uh, the O'Neill School of Public Environmental Affairs, Keith Clay, who used to be here. So those tree species that you mentioned that are in decline, it's really hard to see them, seeing ashes being cut down on the, on the campus just this last summer, a big, beautiful one. And the dogwoods were not one of the ones that you mentioned and we're worried about them. So this invasive species, this invasive fungal, diseases that we're seeing, they're all a large part of globalization and uh, progressive environmental change, including uh, climate change. So yes, those things are all a worry. And, you know, I, I, I sort of run out of words because they're so worrisome. <laughs> so yes, look out for the trees as well as the birds. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of, it's kind of a perfect storm in so many places. You know, I, you mentioned I went to the University of Florida for my PhD and down there, it's just, I mean, it's kind of mind boggling how many invasive species there are in Florida. And, and, you know, you just imagine these native species competing for space, for resources with these invasives. And yeah, the birds are impacted as well because uh, I think there's some recent research showing that um, their immune function, when they eat invasive fruit, they don't do as well in defending themselves from disease. It just doesn't provide the right kind of nutrition as native plants that they've evolved alongside for so many years. It's a very interesting scenario. It's like, well, ecology is messy. <laughs> there's so many different connections at the same time. Um, but yeah, there's, there's no doubt a a decline in biodiversity in general. And that's really what we're trying to address with the MCBB here in Indiana. Really good questions, everyone. Thank you so much. I think that's all of the questions for tonight. Uh, I'm gonna hand it over now, if that's all to um, Vanessa to wrap things up. Thanks everybody. Thank you again for joining us and participating in this evening's live stream. I would like to thank Professor Ketterson and Dr. Jean uh, for their time and expertise. We are grateful to you all. I would also like to thank the IU Alumni Association and its members for assisting with tonight's program. Finally, I should acknowledge that events like this would not be possible without the support of donors who understand the value of a liberal arts education. If you would like to support the faculty, students, and programs of the College of Arts and Sciences, please consider making a contribution to the Arts and Sciences Priority Fund at the IU Foundation. Until next time, please take care and stay safe. <laughs>